morning, everybody, and welcome to our panel on chat GPTification of lending. I will say I practiced that about 10 times because it really doesn't roll off the tongue quite as easy as you might think. So during our discussion today, we will talk about chat GPT, but also have a broader discussion around AI. So we're going to look at where we're at today, where we're going in the future, and we're also going to talk about risks just as a few subjects. And we're gonna do that all from a lending perspective. So as we kick things off, we know AI, and specifically chat GPT, have really captured the imagination of the public. That being said, it's created a call for action and really identified some key organizational challenges. So what is all the hype about? And what are the possibilities and opportunities from a lender's perspective? So joining me today in this very important conversation is I have Justin Herlich, who's the CEO and co-founder of Pine. And then we have Jason Appel, who's the Executive VP and Chief Risk Officer from Go Easy Financial. And then Manny Nikju, who's the CEO and co-founder of QuadFi. So welcome, gentlemen, and thank you for enjoying, um, joining us this morning on the panel. So I know we're going to have a robust and interesting conversation. So to kick things off, um, I was reading this recent survey from EY that said 84% of organizations are going to implement AI in their business in the next 12 months. So maybe give us, well, first of all, why AI is top of mind, but then give us your perspective on the current state of AI in lending and within your organization. So maybe, Manny, I'll ask you to kick things off if you don't mind. Sure. Um, I think the answer is quite evident, Leslie. Uh, probably since the invention of electricity, we haven't witnessed such a powerful yet versatile tool that's going to nearly affect, uh, drastically improve every aspect of our lives. Obviously, the realms of banking and lending in particular are no exception from um, smooth customer experience to a smart underwriting model. I think AI is going to revolutionize them all. At QuadFi, um, we are on mission to uh, address a very important problem, uh, newcomers' access to fair and affordable financial product. Let me tell you a little bit about the customers and how AI is helping us to, to help them. Um, these are people who are coming from different countries, mostly with bright future, but unfortunately, because FICO and FICO-based traditional underwriting models are broken, they're overlooked and disfranchised by the current financial institutions. So they have two options, either going to uh, missionaries of the world or mercenaries, call them. Missionaries are well-intentioned, uh, amazing company with admirable goals, like Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which uh, they, they really want to help people, but they usually struggle with profitability. Um, and then mercenaries are usually uh, some shark lenders with fancy websites. They try to seize every opportunity they have to exploit uh, on this vulnerability of newcomers, offering them brutal rates of 30, 40, 50, sometimes three-digit APRs. So we said, but, but obviously the return are phenomenal. So we said, can we build a model with mercenaries return and missionaries mission and help newcomers to do that? We are a B Corp company, ESG based, and AI helped us a lot. Let me tell you how. We developed, implemented, and trained several uh, models, AI models, which are collected more than 400 inputs globally at the same time. In a matter of seconds, they try to predict people's future income, future cash flow. It's forward looking. And based on that, we are underwriting for those people. And now look at the result. We approved 700%, seven times more people than traditional system with equal default rate. Or with equal approval rate, we had 80% lower default rate than the traditional system. And we did all of that because of the help and use of AI. Wow, that's interesting. I hadn't heard those terms, missionary and mercenaries. But certainly the volume and the growth, that's hugely impressive. Maybe, Justin, from your perspective as well, Cher, I know Pine also has a, a very quick process for approvals. And you're obviously digitally enabled. So maybe from Pine's perspective. Yeah, so if we go back to why everyone's interested in it now, I, I think it's, it's what Manny said, it's very obvious. We've seen a step change in the actual like, improvement and accuracy and functionality of these tools. So everyone's kind of you know, probably been experienced with some level of AI in the last 10 years, 
but the change that we've seen from these new models and the new architectures that have come out have really made it from like, oh, this is like interesting but doesn't really work most of the time to, wow, this works most of the time and you know, sometimes it doesn't. And that has captured the imagination. So that's incredibly exciting and it's a fundamental change in how they've actually programmed the um, technology, right? So at Pine, and for context, anyone who doesn't know what Pine does, we're uh, a platform for Canadian homeowners. We have multiple products. The first product that we came to market with was um, a non-bank mortgage lender. So people come to us uh, to get a mortgage. We underwrite traditionally. What I mean by that is we don't take um, extra factors in. We actually follow a very traditional underwriting model. What we hope to do is use technologies like AI to improve the uh, process. So we're not innovating on the product of what you're getting. A mortgage from Pine looks exactly like a mortgage from anyone else. What we've innovated on is our process. And we've built all of our technology in-house. So we're starting to use AI to say, hey, we were just using traditional engineering techniques, we were able to dramatically reduce the time to approval. So we issue all of our own commitment letters, we built our own underwriting platform, we built our own customer portal. We're bringing AI technology into that now to make it even better. But you do need to be aware of where you can use these types of technologies and where you can't. So we're not using it to like, approve customers who otherwise would not, which is definitely something that can exist for certain models, it's not our model. It's, hey, there's, this, there's these 80 steps that you need to make this mortgage like, manufactured. How do we use AI to cut down steps, you know, 40 through 60, which are typically manual, um, like reviewing a pay stub, or uh, a sales staff or like a mortgage advisor talking to the underwriting team. They're typically writing, okay, here's the notes, here's why this file should be approved, or here's why, you know, the automatic approval went through. Um, all of that kind of language-based technology can now be used to summarize and make things go faster. So we're always looking at how can we cut steps out of the process entirely, which is what I learned, um, I previously was at a company called Blend, where we built the digital mortgage experience for Wells Fargo, U.S. Bank, BMO Harris. So you've touched on something we're going to come back to in a few minutes in terms of the benefits for the customers and, and actually the lending industry, the workforce in the lending industry with AI. But before we get to that, where are we going in the future with AI and generative AI? Um, I mean, we've talked about where we're at today, but where do you see it affecting or shaping the future of lending? Uh, Manny, maybe I'll throw sure. that to you. Sure. Um, before that, let me briefly talk about uh, AI. Some people here necessarily doesn't have a background in, in AI, engineering, computer science. So when, when we talk about AI, it's a super powerful set of tools. And two of them are very famous these days. One of them is supervised learning, and the other one is generative AI or gen AI. Supervised learning is probably most of the models that you guys know. Um, it's working with labeled data. We get some data, some analysis is done, and then some output is going to be generated. It's amazing for labeling classification, fraud versus no fraud, default versus no default in our industry. But obviously, it has the, the highest market share, and it's expected that the revenue of that tool to become double in the next three years. However, the, the highest vibe, the highest growth is coming from Gen AI, thanks to work of two amazing professors, both Canadian, Professor Hinton and Professor Benjil. We have access to a super powerful tool, Gen AI, which basically you train some supervised models constantly and repeatedly until they predict the next word in a sentence. Now, if you train them on a hundred of billions of words on internet, you have access to this powerful machine, which we call them LLM or large language models. So I believe in, in the realm of lending, uh, where Gen AI found its niche or main niche is something we call hyper personalization uh, advisor. We take the pride in uh, being uh, one of the uh, early adapters of this technology. We developed uh, an AI advisor for newcomers. It's called Orange AI. It's available on an app for uh, friends and family at this stage. So basically, let me tell you how it works. It is an app, super smart, talk to you like your personal CFO, personal, personal financial advisor in your own native language, engage with customers in their language, and then learn, monitor, and read customers' financial behavior, then try to guide them. Let's say somebody wants to buy their first home in Canada. So this app know, has a remarkable ability to know exactly how much you're going to save at the end of each month because they know you better than yourself. Then they're going to tell you which neighbor in the city is uh, immigrant friendly, has highest return for newcomers, which bank is offering the best mortgage, which lawyer is the best one, and because you know exactly how much cash flow you're going to have at the end of each month, can craft for you the best one. But it doesn't stop here. Uh, the, it actually has another benefit, which is my favorite. It's going to predict customers' need even before they know about it. We call it application-less banking. Imagine just a customer which uh, habitually rent a car every month. Now. 
if there is no transaction related to auto insurance or auto payment, the advisor knows that that person doesn't have a car, and because the cash flow is under rise, that person is a perfect candidate for an auto loan. So that person is gonna be an offered an auto loan, super happy even without asking in a matter of seconds, and because we know, or the advisor knows, how much that person is gonna pay, what is the best term and best uh, you know, rate for that customer, we can craft a completely tailor-made product based on the need for the customers. You can see how much you can save on CAC, what is the opportunity for cross-selling, and obviously on the customer side, you're gonna have happy customers. So you've jumped in again to talk about benefits. So maybe, Jason, I'll ask you from your perspective, what do you see as the benefits for customers and the lending workforce with AI and generative AI? Yeah, I think there's a bunch of different applications, and I think you've heard a few of them. I'd, I'd start by saying that even some of the more commonplace, traditional modeling capabilities that you see lenders develop and have developed over time, supervised machine learning being the most obvious, I think what's really come about in the last, let's call it several years, is the, sophistica the sophistication of those models, uh, as Justin spoke about, the depth and the richness of the data, the variability of that data, which is now being consumed not only from your own origination experience from your customers, but any other supplementary data you'd be buying, and then the use cases through which those models can now be applied. If you think about traditional credit risk, you're using those models to predict the likelihood of a customer defaulting that will Im inform your decision as to whether or not you're gonna lend, how much, and at what rate, among other things. And now you're starting to see that technology and, and more or less that modeling experience push out into other forms of lending operations, whether that's collecting, whether that's managing anti-attrition on the part of your customers. So even though it's a very traditional form of model building, its use cases and its applications are broadening at quite a fast rate, and they're being supplemented by this onslaught of additional data sources that we as native lenders are not producing ourselves. Mm -hmm. We are now ingesting some of that data through third parties and integrating that data alongside our own to build a better experience. And that experience could be a more predictive model, a better tool that says, what am I gonna give this customer at this point in their life cycle? Kind of what, uh, what Manny spoke about earlier. Mm -hmm. And what's really fascinating for me is the speed with which that data is coming onto the market and because these tools have evolved in their sophistication and their adoption in many lenders, whether you're a large lender like ourselves or a smaller lender, it's the speed with which you can now process those tools to build these models. And to add just one more piece on top of it, you know, when you used to think about model building in the dark ages when I was born, model building involved 90% of your work on data prep, data standardization, data structuring, data cleansing, long before you started to decide whether or not you're gonna do a log regression or some other type of fancy schmancy model. Today you have the development and the build out of more uh, sophisticated tools that automate or simplify many of those processes. So your speed to market with which you can now build these new so-called models has dramatically reduced. Mm -hmm. And now you've got all this so-called freed up time from your developers, whether they be model builders, data scientists, who can now devote their time to more uh, interesting pursuits or more advanced pursuits. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why you've seen this proliferation of model building move outside of the traditional realm of credit risk into these other use cases. And I've only talked about three. I could easily give you another dozen. And they wouldn't have anything to do with credit. They could be uh, operations management. They could be underwriting. They could be uh, customer service management. Everything in those areas is, is undergoing a, a game change because the accessibility of the data and the tools with which we now have access and the speed with which we now have access to build those things is rising at a rate that we haven't seen before. The way I would, I'd leave you is with sort of this thought. I think about what's going on with the AI kind of reminds me of what happened about this thing we called the gold rush in the mid 1800s in California. If you think about the tools that were used to mine gold and let's just replace gold with data because that's the information age we're living in now. Think about what people used for tools to get at gold in that time frame. They had maps, axes. If they were lucky, they got a pair of jeans from Levi Strauss. They were pretty primitive tools. Now let's fast forward 150 years on. I don't think you see a lot of individuals mining for gold anymore. The tool sets are different. The technology is different. The learning is different. I, I see us at a similar sort of stage in the AI journey, except we're not gonna wait 150 years to figure out how to better mine gold we're gonna figure it out in a few years. And the speed with which that's happening is at a rate that none of us really can predict and, and have experienced before. 
So great insights there, and we're talking about benefits, customers, workforce. So let's flip the coin on the other side. What about risks? Um, all of you have implemented AI in your business as it sits today. Uh, can you share with us what you see as potential risks with the implementation of AI and generative AI or going forward, other things that you're keeping top of mind that could be risks? Because as you just said, Jason, the pace is so fast, it touches so many parts of your business. So let's dig in a little bit on risks. Who wants to jump in first on that? Happy to. Okay. So particularly with Gen AI, I think you have to be uh, concerned with any model that's non-deterministic. And what, what's non-deterministic mean? It means that if you give it the same input, you can get different results as opposed to more traditional programs and applications where if you put something in, like if you dial the phone, you're always going to get the same person on the other end. If you give the same prompt to um, a generative model, even the exact same model, you're going to get different responses every time, right? So it means you have to understand that there's a realm of possibilities of what can be put out there. So anything that um, is customer facing, so a chat bot, I think is like the one that people think of, like a customer support. Let's say a client comes to my website, it's 2 a.m., we don't have any staff, but we want to be able to serve them, so we put an AI model in front of them. Well, these models being non-deterministic are going to say different things, even with the exact same prompts, which is not what would have been the case one or two years ago, where these kind of models followed like trees. And it's like, okay, you say this, we read your intent. If we think the intent is this, you're going to get this response, right? But now it's, we're generating the whole response on the fly, right? So you need to be very careful about anything that's being exposed directly to the customer, because mm. anything that's being exposed directly to the customer could have content that you are not comfortable with which again, humans do the same thing. So it's, it's yeah. like there's a line, but you can train and you can inform them a bit better. So you need to be very careful about um, actually understanding that you do not have complete control over what's gonna come out of the other end before you put any type of technology in front of a consumer. So our generative AI use cases are all internal. So if an, a mortgage advisor says something that's not nice to an underwriter, it's okay because it's all internal, but we wouldn't put that content in front of a customer. I, um, if you don't mind, I, I respectfully disagree. Um, so before I become an entrepreneur, I'm a scientist in the field. I have a PhD in AI. And, um, you know, I, I obviously nobody can, can deny that, you know, it's a stochastic process, lots of problems with it. We are dealing with bias risk, um, accuracy, data security. And I'm talking about general application, not only in lending. Um, but the reality is, uh, we, we know that the benefits of AI and Gen AI is going to far exceed its risks. We know this technology is improving so much so fast. I'm an optimist in the field. Uh, and I know lots of people are infusing a big universal fear about AI in general and Gen AI, uh, which some of them are uh, unfortunately infused with some opportunistic, which Mark Anderson is calling them bootleggers. Um, let me talk about two of the common myth which people are talking about it a lot these days. One is AI is gonna kill all of us, humankind, yeah? <laughs> uh, it's a categorical, uh, you know, uh, incorrect uh, statement. AI is just some code, some mathematical logics developed by human, implemented by human, trained by human, owned by human, controlled by human. Uh, obviously, I think it's the other way around. It will, we'll see, save us from some existential threats, such as probably the next pandemic, probably the climate crisis, probably some wars. And yes, there's some universal standards. We shouldn't you know, promote AI for child pornography, and everybody agree. But the reality is it doesn't have, it's as alive as your fridge at home. It's, it's not a tool that can come and kill you. Second one is, oh, AI is going to get all of our jobs. Again, it's coming from the second fallacy in economics. We call them a lump of labor fallacy. Basically means the total number of jobs in a society is constant. And if a machine is doing some of them, human cannot do those jobs, which is, again, wrong. We saw that at the beginning of 2000 with, uh, you know, those outsourcing later on in automation in 2010. In economics, it's very obvious for those of you who are interested, you can read about it. When the situation is like that, when productivity is going up, which AI is go doing for us, the amount of saving for customers and people are going to go up, and then demand are going to be created in other areas, and the wages are going to go higher. So um, what will be the end game? I think it's going to be a collaboration, a cooperation between human and machine. 
simply because AI, at least for the next few decades, is not gonna get some of the basic things that we have, like common sense. If I ask you, Leslie, please go and buy me a cup of coffee, and we're sitting at D-Bar at Four Seasons, you probably come back and says, it's $20, are you sure you want it? But AI doesn't do that. It has just one objective, I'm maximizing poor coffee in your cup. So uh, for those of you who are a fan of chess, uh, in 80s and 90s, when Deep Blue came up, that uh, you know, uh, supercomputer, uh, Gary Kasparov at the time played against it and he lost. And everybody was writing about, oh, this machine is the future of chess. Later on, human tried and beat them, actually. Today, the best ch chess player is not Max and Carlson, it's not a human, it's not a supercomputer. It's actually a combination of these two, which is proven, which works perfectly better than each one of them individually. So there are some risks, there are some threats, but I'm really optimistic about the future of technology. And if you want a coffee, there's a Tim Hortons out here. I don't mind buying you one <laughs> later, Manny. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't ask our risk panel expert here to touch on this subject as well. Yeah, so I'd like to draw from, from what both of you said. I sort of would highlight three risks, all of which, and I agree with Manny, I think are, are ones we can mitigate or at least present opportunities and not necessarily challenges. So one risk is um, explainability. A lot of the models that we're developing, depending on their use case or their application, are really good at predicting a certain outcome. The problem is the means by which they predict that outcome are very hard to explain. So let's talk about that in practical terms. When a customer comes to your front door and applies online for credit and gets declined, what do you tell them was the reason why they got declined? It was a black box, it was this very complex variable, or it was a neural net model where you can't even identify the source. The risks that we run in building some more of these sophisticated tools is we have to make sure we balance, again, the, the offset, we balance the ability to make these models somewhat explainable in terminology that the person who is affected or the persons who are affected by their models understands. And since, uh, as a lender, we're in the business of building relationships with customers, the stakes have changed. It's no longer good enough for us to simply say, you're declined, or you're approved for $2,000 at 19.99%. There is going to come a, a period of time where people are gonna say, well, well why? And it can't be, well, because your credit score is crappy. Like, it, those, those won't stand in this era of information overload. So as, as lenders, we have to be mindful that as we progress the sophistication of these modeling tools, that we balance them with some ability to explain them, certainly when they interact or affect customer interactions. Second issue, as I mentioned before, we're all, as lenders, in, uh, ingesting far more data than we've ever ingested before. And some of that data is not ours. It comes to us from third parties that we purchase from or, or partner with. Those data sets may or may not have inherent biases or structures embedded in them. And if we're going to ingest that information and build models in combination or on top of them, we can't lose sight of the fact that there may or may not be inherent risk with that data. Now, again, you can mitigate that by challenging those data providers or those data sources if they are manipulating or managing their data in certain ways about how they're doing that. You simply should not take that data at face value. You should be as critical of that data as you would be your own when you're doing your own modeling. Third risk is when you're talking about all the different applications that you know, all of us have mentioned, whether it's Gen AI or, or, or other forms of AI in, in machine learning and whatnot, I think the key is be very mindful of the risk of jumping in too fast, too quickly. POCs, proof of concepts, are the way I think that we can manage that risk but in order to do really to a really good proof of concepts, I think there are two things you've got to bear in mind. You have to have a very good testing regime. You've got to be very clear what it is you're trying to learn from any type of AI application you're trying to ingest into your business. And as a result, make sure you have a well-designed test. Don't bias your populations. Keep it random. And probably the second piece I would say is have very, very, very good measurement capabilities and data capture and understand what those KPIs are that you're trying to measure. And the last piece I would say, and I want to bring it back to what Manny said, is do not ignore the human in the loop. AI is not meant to take humans out of our day-to-day -day jobs. And when you think about the ideas of bringing new AI, new concepts to your business, whether you're a lender or in some other activity, you still need a human being to interpret information, and you still need a human being to decide what may or may not be right, and you still need that human being to go out and talk to perhaps that customer service agent who is reading off of a chatbot directive that you built using a Gen AI predictor because that agent and the behaviors of that agent translate into how the customer reacts from which you are then capturing data and building even more models. 
So when I talk about the human in the loop, the risk is that you avoid realizing that many of the KPIs that you use to manage these, PPC, uh, these, these POCs, they're driven off of human behavior. And to manage and understand human behavior, you gotta talk to humans. You just can't talk to data. The KPIs that we use to measure these things are manifested in what humans do, whether they're internally working for our companies or their customers we're trying to do business with or engage lifetime value for. So I would say to mitigate those risks, make sure you've got good testing, you've got good measurement, and that you don't forget to keep the human in the loop when evaluating the success of those programs. Great, thank you. <clears throat> um, this has been like the fastest 30 minutes I think I've ever experienced. So we're right down to the wire in time. I don't know if we get a big beep here at the end when we run out, but just maybe last question I would ask each of the panelists to contribute before we close things off is you've all implemented AI in your business. You've all had some wins, probably some pitfalls going through the process, some do's, some don'ts. Maybe leave folks in the room that haven't started on this journey yet one piece of advice that they could take away from the discussion today that when they go back to their business they should be thinking about when it comes to a implementation of AI or generative AI in their business. Just a nugget as a takeaway that based on your experience in your role and in your business. Yeah, for sure. I think just following up on that last point, um, where's the first place you can do it, right? It sounds like it's a whole paradigm shift and it's totally new technology. Well. If you've integrated other platforms and other tools, it's just like that. So find the first place where you can do a proof of concept, bring it in, understand how this technologies work, and then see how you can bring it to other parts. It's, it's, uh, you don't need to be scared or, or daunted by the implementation process. Jason? Yeah, I would just, I would echo, um, failure is good here. Trial and error, the actual more important part is the error. As long as you're not making bad bets or large bets, to Justin's point, start small. Uh, pick manageable pieces and accept the fact that failure is gonna be part of your learning journey. If you do that, good things will come. And hey Manny. If I wanna talk in 30 seconds, um, probably I will talk to entrepreneurs. I know the entire ecosystem is talking about the B2C business model. The reality is for so many years, um, or versus B2B, so many years those uh, model developers um, and credit bureaus are asking banks to give them data. The next generation of model development and, and credit and AI, you need direct relationship with customers because you need dynamic data, which is changing over time, and you need data which is comprehensive beyond just their debt payment. And that's why you see Experian is offering direct-to-customer services. I think the biggest threat for incumbents in terms of model development in the next 10 years is not gonna be a financial institution. It's gonna be Apple and Google of the world which have access to customers. Today, the most accurate underwriting model is coming from Ant Financial in China, which is trained on Alibaba's um, you know, customer purchase data. So forget about B2B benefits. I know especially in Canada, banks are pushing it toward that. You need this interaction with customers. You need to interact and get data from them. Thank you, gentlemen, for a very informative and interesting panel. I wish we had more time, but I hope the group today found value in it. I certainly did, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.